In this video, we're going to be working on switch adapting a mouse. What I'm using for today's demonstration is actually a off-the-shelf Dell mouse. This is the MS111P, although you can't see it on camera. Those model numbers for the mice are printed on the bottom somewhere. Uh, you'll find when you open up the Dell mice that um, they're actually pretty similar inside, though. There may be some variations in the model number, but essentially we'll be seeing the same things once we uh, open up inside. In addition to the mouse, we'll be using a 3.5 millimeter female mono jack. This is what we'll actually use to connect our switch. So in the end product, we'll be able to connect a commercial switch into the mouse and have this serve as a left, right, or middle click, uh, depending on what connections we make and what our mouse casing allows in terms of the number of switch connections. We'll also be using some speaker wire. In this case, I'm using 24 gauge stranded wire. It's got two conductors. We'll need a soldering iron and lead-free solder. For this project as well. You want to be careful to make sure that the solder you use is designed for electrical work. Uh, the solder that's available for plumbing applications actually has acid in it which would be destructive to the electronics that we're working with. We'll also need to have some wire strippers for this project and wire cutters and it would be useful to also have available a utility knife of some sort, and we'll need a screwdriver to undo the uh, casing of the mouse. So with the Dell mice, actually I'm going to start here with my precision knife. These have a screw or two, depending on the model, that are located underneath these pads. So for this purpose, you'll want to carefully use your razor blade to peel away this backing. And you want to proceed with caution because we're actually not going to be removing this permanently. It helps to have the mouse glide over the surface of the desk. So we do need to make sure we're maintaining this protective strip here. But once we peel that away, we can see that there's a mouse hole there, or a screw hole there in the mouse. And I'm just going to insert my Phillips head tip and loosen that up. Now these two screws are tiny, so it's uh, helpful to have a little box or bag uh, handy on your workstation to retain that so it doesn't roll off while you're working. I'm going to put this aside in my trusty little box. And just to uh, keep any dust from getting onto that, I'm going to lightly reapply that adhesive there. So now with a simple pull along the casing here, we'll be able to disassemble the mouse from the back. But we're still going to get a little bit of tension there. So carefully, just with a little bit of force, we're going to pop that open. We want to be careful. There are plastic clips down here that the top of the mouse fits into so we don't want to snap those off inadvertently when we're removing or replacing the cover of the mouse. We'll put that aside for now. So inside here we're looking at the mechanics. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is since we don't need to have all this cable flopping around on us while we're doing this project, we're going to remove the power cord here. So that's a little white box that we're seeing on the uh, right hand side. You may need to get some pliers as well. If you've got large fingers like mine, it's a little hard to grip these small pieces. We'll just pry this out here. And then you'll find that the cable is just running along this track, so we can just pop that out. We'll be replacing this after all of our soldering is done, so again, we can just put this aside in our little parts box for the time being. 
Now, on some models of mice, you'll also want to look here. Uh, there are occasionally screws holding down the board to the plastic housing. That's not the case with this one, so we can just lift it out. And we'll see this little bit of plastic here that works with the light uh, for the optical mouse component. That does come out. You'll just want to pay attention to it when you start your job, which way it uh, goes in when you're replacing it. It won't close off its in incorrectly, but again, this piece here we can put aside for the time being. With most of the mice that you're going to be working with, there's actually three buttons on the mouse. Our left mouse click, our right mouse click, and then our wheel also is, is a, a mouse. So when we look inside here, we'll see actually that the uh, switches that are controlled by those mouse buttons are located here. So these little black modules here are, are switches. This is our left click button here. This is our right click. And then the wheel, which I'm going to very gently remove. You want to pay attention because sometimes there are springs attached to these and other models of mice. Um, and those are easy to lose. But uh, that wheel will be removed and that shows us the third middle click switch there for this. So what we're going to do as part of our application for adapting this mouse is on this particular model, we actually have enough space in here. You'll notice there's not a lot of uh, components sticking up off the board. So this Dell mouse is particularly nice in allowing us to have connections to each of these three switches. For today's video, however, we're just going to focus on doing this for the left mouse button function. You'll notice that the white button here on top is actually the switch mechanism. So when you press a mouse button, there's a tiny piece of plastic that depresses that and activates the click. We're going to turn this over and take a look. What we're going to be connecting to is two of these pins here on the bottom of the switch. We're going to be running wires from here to the um, the mono jack so that our switch can be used to operate this as well as the, the mouse button itself. So we're going to be looking at the pin that is closest to the top or closest to the white button, the opposite side of the switch, and the pin that's in the middle. The other tool that would uh, be most helpful anytime you're doing soldering is an extra set of hands. So this is a helping hands. Uh, these often come with a magnifying glass, but um, I removed mine with my large hand. So <laughs> that was just one other thing getting in the way and my vision's okay yet. So in most cases though, you'll also have a magnifying glass extending off of these. So I'm going to place here my circuit board, my panel getting ready for us to make these connections. In order to uh, make this connection though, we're going to cut off a segment of our 24 gauge wire. I'm going with an, about three inches here. You'll want to start with a larger piece, a longer piece than you think you may need it's often necessary to cut it down in size so that everything can fit inside the housing of the mouse once it's reassembled. Some of the mouse casings actually don't leave you a lot of space like the Stell one does. Sometimes shortening the wire is necessary to make sure you've got good closure on the casing. So I just use my knife there to just separate these a little bit so that I can pull them apart more easily. What we're going to do is strip each of these. Now depending on your speaker wire some of these um, will have different color interiors. In this case 
both of these are copper on the inside, but sometimes you'll see a, a lead infused or tin infused copper line. So one of these would have a silver appearance and the other would have a copper appearance. That's really helpful when you have wire like that because uh, it's easy to know which end's connecting to, to which end on the other side. In other cases, you might use two different color wires like red and black or red and white. This particular wire, although you won't be able to see it on camera, has a clear jacket around this bottom wire here. And on the top one, there's this thin white strip running through the uh, outside layer of the wiring. And that's uh, a way that you can keep tabs on, on which end to connect when you're doing your soldering. It's also handy to have a multimeter to test for continuity. And actually, I'll pull mine out in a little bit to do that as well. So with my wire strippers, again, this is 24 gauge stranded wire. So <laughs> trying to get one that actually is uh, small enough for that. So here we go. I have my wire stripper. On this particular one, you'll see solid markings for wire on this side and stranded or on this side. So since this is 24 stranded, I'm going to go into this second to last hole and remove the stripping. Some people are able to do this with their fingernails if they're a little longer. Some people prefer to do this with a utility knife. Either one of those is suitable as an alternative to wire strippers. Please do not use your teeth though for that. It's a good way to get an unintended trip to the dentist. I'm going to give these a little bit of a wrap just to keep those strands from coming loose. Now I've removed a bit more of the jacket than I need to, so once I tin these up, I'm going to actually uh, cut those a bit. Also going to, while I'm at it, do the same with the second side. And at least get those separated right now. So now it's time to uh, get our solder gun in place here. In order to help me along here, I'm going to bring my helping hands back in and just clamp this wire into the helping hands so that I can have that in front of me. I'm going to grab my electrical solder and right now all I'm going to do is get some solder onto the copper wire itself. This will make it a lot faster and, and simpler when I make the connection to the circuit board in a bit. Anytime you're soldering, you want to uh, make sure your iron's nice and hot. And then we're going to start by tinning the tip of the soldering iron. That smoke coming off is just the, the rosin core steaming away. You don't want to breathe that in, so just blow away that puff as it comes up towards you. You're going to hold the soldering iron underneath the wire to heat it, and then touch the solder. To get our tip and we'll do the same with the second connection here. I've got here off to the side off camera my handy solder iron holder so I can keep my uh, soldering iron ready for use and has a wet sponge here for me to clean the tip off. It's important to keep that tip clean and always to retin it when you're, you're soldering. Otherwise, the tip will oxidize and you'll be replacing that with greater frequency than you really need to or want to. All right, so now I've got uh, both ends of the wire there tinned. You can see the solder on there. I'm going to use my wire cutters just to nip that a little closer because that's certainly much more exposed wire than we need to have on our, our mouse. Right. It's a good idea to have safety glasses on while you're doing this. Uh, these wire cutters tend to uh, send those little pieces of metal flying up at you. So it's good to have your glasses on as, as I do.
one thing you want to pay attention to when you are connecting your wiring is you want to take a look at the casing itself to see what limitations you have and where the wire can run. With the Dell here, I can notice that there is an opening in the casing here and an opening here. So those are the two places that I could possibly have my wire running out. Uh, it's going to be coming up from underneath to one of the sides here where we'll be drilling some holes for the mono jack. So you'll want to make sure you see where your wire is going to be traveling before you do the soldering because sometimes uh, it's a little hard to manage the wire movement after the soldering has been done. So again we're going to focus on the left mouse here. Switch 1 is what's marked on the panel SW1. So when I flip it over here it's going to be the one on my right side. And now as we look at it we're going to be connecting one end of the wire to this first connection and the second wire to the middle connection there. On my, the wire that I'm using, I am actually going to be running the clear wire, the one that doesn't have the white stripe, or in this case the uh, copper wire, to the middle pin connection on my switch. For those of you using copper and silver wire, the silver then would be connected to the tip end. All right. There's really not a standard for doing this. The important thing is for you to make sure that you're consistent in your work. And again, a continuity tester is going to help us verify those connections before we continue on here. All right. So now I've got this set up so my jacket with the white lining is on the top there. And that I'm actually, that white one is going to be connecting to my tip. So let's actually do that one first. I already have solder on the wire, so that should be sufficient for me to make this connection without any additional solder. There's some solder on the board already from the pin through connection, and there's some on my tip as well. So I'm going to briefly hold this down to heat both of those connections and we're solidly affixed there. I'm going to separate this wire a little bit more just to give myself some play. And then we're going to bend the second wire down and make the connection of the clear copper wire to the middle pin. You don't want to hold this there for too long because you do run the risk of damaging the electrical connection. Looks like I need a little bit more solder there, however. We are good to go. This cools down and hardens almost immediately. So I give it a tug there. My connection's solid. All right. So that's the first part of our connection done here. And again, as we take a look at this then, with the circuit board back in place, I've got the wire able to come up through that area of the casing there. So I don't have any barriers and there's still room for that hinge connection that will be so important later on. So what we're going to be doing is running this wire to a position here. So I already see that I've got uh, certainly more 
length here than I need. So I'm going to separate the wire down. And cut this off to a shorter length. No sense having all that extra cable there if I don't need it. I'm going to take this out and strip the ends off of those two pieces of wire that I just uh, shortened. So again, I'll set this into the channel for 24 gauge stranded wire. Remove the insulation from one. Remove from the second. Now for the next connection, we're going to need the mono jack. So I'm going to insert this into my helping hands here. When you purchase these, you're actually going to have a couple different options, uh, whether they're open frame like this one is, or closed frame. Closed frame would have a plastic enclosure around these. Those generally will take up more space, and since space is already at a premium inside the mouse housing, uh, I, I chose to go with an open frame. There are also open circuit connectors or closed circuit connectors. It doesn't matter for this application which one you use. I happen to be using closed circuit connectors. So we've actually got an extra tab here as a result. With an open circuit connector, we would only have two tabs here as well as the tip. As we did before, we're going to prep these wires by applying a bit of solder to the ends. I'm going to give these a twist as well. I usually like to do that to keep those strands, stray strands from popping up. Now you may be wondering why use the strands then and why not just go with a solid wire. Uh, that's certainly an option. You'll find though that the stranded wire is more flexible and when you need to make bends and twist the, the wiring around inside the mouse housing, it's going to be a little easier to work with than a, a solid core wire. But if that's your preference or that's all you happen to have available, a solid wire would work just fine for this purpose as well. Clean off my tip there with the sponge. Apply some tin. There we go. So, as I'm wiring this, I chose to use the white stranded jacking wire to go to the lead terminal here. When I connect to the panel mount over here to the mono jack, I'm going to want to have that connecting to the tip connection. So as we look at this, the tip is actually referring to the tip of the male end. So in a mono connection, we have the tip and the sleeve. You'll sometimes see these referred to as TS jacks. So that's referring to tip and sleeve. With a stereo connection, you would see a second black band separating this segment into two, in which case you'd have a tip, a ring, and a sleeve, or TRS. That would allow you to have one signal going to uh, the right ear, one signal going to the left ear, and then one going to ground. With headset microphones, and certainly the headphones you would see with like your iPod, um, 
you'll actually see an additional ring, and those are referred to as tip ring ring sleeve connections, or TRRS. And that has a channel then for the microphone. Since the switches that we typically use in assistive technology are mono connections, I tended to go with mono components. As we look at this closed circuit one, this is what the tip will connect to. When we insert or switch in. So there's a solid connection there. And then the other connectors that we have here will either go to the ground or to the tip. So this is where your multimeter can really come in hand to let you know what you're working with. So I have my multimeter here. Uh, on many of these, one of the settings you'll find has symbols like that. That's your continuity checker. So I'm going to turn my dial onto that. And this will basically just emit a sound when continuity is detected between two locations. So the sleeve comes into contact with the metal inside the uh, entry to the port here. So I'm holding the black probe down inside the sleeve area there. I'm going to touch each tip to determine whether there's continuity. This one I know by touching the red probe to it is not connected to the ground here because I'm not hearing a beep. This would be going to the tip and we'll verify that later as well with our continuity checker. I'm going to tap here to the right side. Again, no continuity. So these two I know are going to connect to the tip, which means when I touch my red probe to the one on the left, that is the tab that I will solder to to connect with the sleeve or ground. To verify that the other two are for my tip connection, I'm going to hold one probe to that tip connection and then test for continuity on the remaining tabs. So that goes to tip and that one goes to tip. So the first connection that I'm going to make is to go to my sleeve. So it's going to be this tab here that I'll solder to. I'm going to put that on the top. Again, I find it easiest to apply some solder to the component before I start. I'm going to hold my soldering iron underneath to heat up the tab and apply a bead of solder. I'm going to be generous here onto that. And we'll verify again since we've got the multimeter out. Right now we're doing the connection to ground with this one that we soldered. So we need to connect to the ground, which is the middle tab here in our mouse. This wire, we want to make sure we're connecting the proper end. So I'll hold my probe there. and verify that that's the wire we'll be connecting to the ground connection on the mono jack. So I like to bend the other one out of the way for now just to uh, make it a little clearer when I'm doing these soldering. Sometimes it's easy, particularly when the wire jacking 
a little hard to figure out. Now I'm going to hold my tinned wire on top of that solder I just put on the ground lead. And I've made my connection. Now all that's remaining is to make the second connection wire to the tip. From our continuity test, we know that either one of these will work. I like to go to the one that's the farthest distance away. So I'm going to solder that onto that terminal there. Again, let's prep that by applying a bead of solder the terminal and then make our wire connection. Since I'm done soldering now I'm going to go ahead and just unplug my soldering iron since we're done with that for the day. Again, if we were adapting a mouse to provide switch access to the others, we would do a similar connection of a jack to the terminals on the other two mice. Tip again is the one closest to the white button, and the ground is the middle connection on, on your switches. This Dell mouse actually is a very good candidate for making those all three of those switches adaptable. There's a lot of room inside the housing, so this is a particularly nice mouse to provide switch access to all three functions. Now that I have that in place and soldered, I'm going to put it back in the bottom here and start taking a look at where my wire needs to travel. So I'm going to loop around the side of the switch here. We don't want to go over top because that could impede the travel of the mouse button and the plastic that would activate the, uh, the switch for a traditional user. And what we're going to do is find the location on the side of the housing here where we want to drill our hole for our mount. I'm going to grab a Sharpie real quick. I have these nice metallic Sharpies that are uh, helpful. For marking on black plastic. I can just put a little dot there. That's going to be my indicator of where I want to uh, drill my hole for the mono jack. For this next step we're going to be using a five, or 15 64th drill bit to, to make a, a hole in our plastic casing. I'm using a hand drill here I got from a local craft store. Mine's seen some wear and tear and is actually in need of a replacement, but it should suffice for what we're doing today. Certainly if you've got a power drill or cordless screwdriver, that will work as well. Now in cases like this, you may find it's helpful to put this in a vise. When you do, just be careful that you're not applying any pressure to these plastic components that are sticking up. You don't want to break those off because in some cases that will prevent you from being able to reassemble the mouse. I'm actually just going to do a quick little turn here to get that started. And I think I made it go to my vice, which is off camera. I'll be back in a second. All right, I'm back now. I um, actually like having access to that hand drill. While it might have been a little quicker with a cordless screwdriver or a power drill, 
I like the fact that I can go nice and slow and not heat up that plastic like I might happen if I was drilling at a higher speed. So at this point, we're ready to reassemble the mouse so we can use it again. So you remember I placed aside before that clear plastic panel for the optical mouse to register. So we're going to put that back in place. I'm also going to connect the mouse wheel back in. So this just inserts into a little slot here on the side. Again, that positions it over that mouse button. And then I'm going to drop that down into the platform. You generally want to have this place first. Sometimes your hole is drilled real close to the circuit board. So if you put this mounting piece in first, you may not be able to get the board in underneath or around it. The other thing we have to do here is remove the little locking nut that is on the mono jack. So we're going to unscrew that and put it aside here. That's going to secure it to the outside here in a second. So go ahead and insert our threads through our, the hole we just made. If you've got large fingers like me, it might be helpful to have needle nose to help you get a grip there. All right, and now we're going to re replace that locking ring on the outside. I'll get it started here with my fingers. You'll want to tighten this up with a pair of needle nose pliers so that this doesn't move. Uh, you certainly don't want this coming loose and having to open up the mouse again just to resecure this and retrieve a part that may have popped in. Gonna have to over crank it, but uh, we certainly want it snug. All right, so now we've got all of our components back in place. We can help to route the wire here around. I'll use the tip of my needle nose again just to help form that wire so it's as snug as I can get it to the circuit board. And then we'll need to reconnect the USB cord with the power connection. These are slotted, so they only go in one way. That's idiot proof, I like to say. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and reconnect that cable by lining up those slots and pushing firmly down. Now I'm going to use my needle nose again just to reroute the wire to the front here. Get that pressed down and around. And we are almost done with our switch adaptation. Now you remember before when we disassembled this, I talked about those two tabs that hinge. So we're going to put this in the place and this. We'll take a little bit of finessing. Ooh, I got lucky that time. Popped right in. And then we'll close. I always like to test to make sure the mouse function feels and sounds like it did before. Everything's lined up, so we're actually in a good place. Everything's lined up. Those hinges are both tied in beautifully. So now we're just left to replacing that screw underneath our pad. Just going to gently lift that up again. Go to my trusty little box that kept my screw from rolling, rolling away. We'll tighten that down. Again, give it a check. Make sure you, you haven't tightened too much and stop the mouse from functioning. And then we're going to apply some pressure to reseat that padding there. Make that for a nice gliding motion. All right, so at this point we are finished with our switch adapted mouse. Our users will be able to connect their mono switch. And this will perform the same function as a left click on our mouse. Uh, again, we still have function of the traditional mouse button, but 
we've now got an accessibility option for other users. Thanks for your time today.